Hi, my name is Roland Himmelhuber. I'm a grad student at the College of Optical Sciences at the University of Arizona. Today we are going to make an electro-optical modulator. And to do that, first thing to do, we have to go into the clean room. This is our micro and nano fabrication room, the class 100 clean room with yellow light everywhere. I'm standing next to our uh, MA6 mask liner from Carl Suess. The device that we're going to build today is a pretty straightforward and simple phase modulator. The structure is going to be as follows. You're going to have silicon dioxide at the very bottom. Then there will be a layer of sol gel material. On top of this, we will pattern thin gold electrodes. After this step, we are going to etch a trench into the sol gel material. And after that, spin electro-optic active polymer on top of everything. The light will be confined in this area where the trench will act as a waveguide. From a top view, the device looks like this. Again, we have our straight trench or waveguide going through the whole device. There will be contact pads for the electrodes on both sides of the waveguide. And the actual electrodes will be sitting here and there. Later you'll see we use conductive epoxy to make contact here to a voltage source as well as here. I right now taking out photoresist from a small reservoir into the syringe. Um, we're going to filtrate the photoresist before application through a 800 nanometer um, polyethylene membrane filter. And now I'm going to walk over there to basically apply, to apply the photoresist to the sample. I am now applying the photoresist to the gold-covered wafer. The spin coder will rotate very fast and spread the photoresist out onto a film that's going to be approximately 400 nanometers thick. This we will dry on a hot plate and afterwards it's ready for uh, patterning. Now the photoresist is spread into a thin film that I will now place onto a hot plate to remove residual solvent so when I can grab it. The drying time for photoresist is very, and drying temperature is fairly critical as you want to remove as much organic solvent as possible at the same time if you dry it too hard the process parameters uh, will be completely different and you will not be able to get good patterns. It's also a little bit dependent on the relative humidity you have in the air but as long as you do it the same every time and you have good process control about anything else you're normally in good shape. I'm drying this for one minute at 115 degrees. A mask liner is used to replicate a pattern that you have on a photo mask like this one um, where the pattern is chrome and the, uh, the clear sides are uh, quartz onto a substrate that has been um, covered in our case with photoresist or any other light sensitive material. I'm placing the photo mask in the mask holder. It's built in a way that it's exactly uh, aligned with the rest of the machine and it's held in place by vacuum. So now it's, it's sucked to the holder with vacuum and I can turn it around without falling it off. Now this mask holder is placed inside the mask aligner. I'm going to press the exposure button. This is going to come for and expose the sample through the photo mask. Now it's making contact between the sample and the mask.
The exposure lasts for 45 seconds. Now we can remove the exposed sample and start to develop the exposed photoresist. I'm now lowering the exposed uh, photoresist sample into a photoresist developer and the exposed parts will be developed away and the unexposed parts will stay. So now as I do that you should see patterns appear going to take up to 45 seconds. So now I'm rinsing the sample to remove residual uh, developer with deionized water. Now I'm blow drying it with nitrogen and we are now ready to go to the metal edge step. Now we will put the gold with the pattern photoresist in a gold edge solution that will remove the parts where there is no photoresist left and the gold parts that are protected by photoresist will stay. So now you start to see the electrodes appear because they are protected by the photoresist and the unprotected parts of the gold are removed by the etchant. So after around a minute of etching, the unprotected gold was removed and the electrodes that we're going to use for modulation are staying. Again, removing residual etch and blow drying. So the electrode pattern is described very easily. Those small little round pads are contact pads. This is where we're actually going to make contact to those electrodes from the outside world. Um, you see there is one pad here and one pad there and there are small little stripes going towards the middle and what looks like one big uh, stripe are actually two stripes. They are both around 30 microns wide and are separated by 10 micrometers and we will pattern the waveguide right in between them and those are just one, two, three, four, five pairs of electrodes so we will have five phase modulators from this chip. Now that we have put down the electrodes and patterned them, we are applying a second layer of photoresist that will be used to pattern trenches into the underlying sol gel material. Those trenches later will be filled with the electro-optic active polymer. Again, the sample is now dried on a hot plate for exactly one minute. When we looked at the pattern gold electrodes, we saw there's a big stripe and two small stripes going away to the big circles. As I said, the stripe in the middle are actually two stripes separated by 10 micron. And this small little line here is on the mask and this is, represents the trench that we're going to pattern later. I'm now going to move the camera upwards and for comparison those are those now fairly large looking circles are the small little circles I was pointing out earlier on the mask. I'm now going to move the substrate to the approximately correct position for alignment and this small little square here is an alignment mark that is on the mask 
and those four dots is an alignment mark that is sitting on the sample. The challenging part now is to align um, those two alignment marks exactly over each other to make sure that the trench that we're going to pattern to fill with EO polymer will be exactly between the two electrodes. This is very crucial because metal will cause tremendous losses in the optical transmission when it's too close to the guided mode. And when I say precise, in this case it's with that down to one micron of alignment. So we should be better, plus minus one micron is acceptable for this special configuration. The actual alignment will happen at a much higher magnification than what you can see right now. Okay. And it's a vertical, lateral, as well as angular alignment. And there are many, many alignment marks to make sure that the angle is correct. What I now have to do is I have to align the alignment marks of the mask with the alignment marks that are already on the substrate. Um, what you see here right now is the alignment mark of the mask being in focus and that blurry thing to the right are the alignment marks on the substrate. Um, I can change the focus and now the substrate alignment marks are in focus and switch back to the mask. The resolution now is so high that I can't have both in focus at the same time because they can't be at the right height as the substrate has to be able to move, therefore it cannot be in contact with the mask. But what, what this machine can do is when I press a button, it takes a snapshot of this picture and then focus it down to where the substrate is and I'll have a live video feed together with this picture and I'm going to do that now. So it's going to take in the snapshot and now focusing down to the substrate. So I'm going to see both in focus at the same time. And now it's fairly easy to align the substrate with the mask just to make sure that we did a good job, I'm going to bring them in contact now because now I don't have to move them anymore. And it looks like we did a pretty good job and this is where I would press the exposure button. So the controls of the MA6 are fairly intuitive. Um, this joystick here is for either moving the microscope, the microscope set or the substrate, you can easily switch that by pressing this button. Um, this XY buttons do have the exact same uh, function, the only difference is that if you only press these, it's, you can't by accident move in the Y direction, either with the joystick you can. The joystick movement is a little bit faster. Um, you can also press the fast button, which will make what is only useful for very, very rough alignment or if you have to um, move over a large distance. Um, these buttons here, this top bottom button here allows you to change focus from bottom to top. This is the grab image button I was talking about earlier. Um, all these buttons are basically to program the machine on what your exposure program has, should be. Um, these knobs here allow me to change the focus because your substrate is never at the exact same position, so I can adjust the focus here. Um, this gives me control about uh, how much pressure I'm applying to the chuck and the mask and how much vacuum I'm pulling. Once we are satisfied with our alignment, the only thing left to do is to press the exposure button and the pre-programmed exposure program will go on, the microscope is moving up, the light source is, well the mirror of the light source is moving forward. We're going to expose again for 35 seconds. The machine is now lowering the chuck where the sample sits on. It's bringing it back to the null position right in the middle. It's 
bring the microscope down again and it's now telling me that I can pull this out and remove my exposed substrate. So as before the exposed parts of the photoresist will be removed and the unexposed parts will stay. This might be hard to see because you're only exposing very small parts. Again, we're removing residual developer with deionized water. Now that we have the trenches patterned, this uh, sample would go to the microscope station for um, pattern inspection before we do the final etch into the sol gel. The sol gel is etched with so-called buffered oxide etch. The buffered oxide etch contains hydrofluoric acid which dissolves the inorganic oxidic backbone of the sol gel material. Before I remove the sample from the BOE and out of the hood, I rinse it with deionized water to remove any residual uh, amount of the buffered oxide etch. It will be rinsed again later. Finally, the leftover photoresistor is removed so that the remaining gold will make good contact to the EO polymer. After the trenches are etched and has been inspected again under a microscope to ensure that the pattern is exactly what we want, we apply the electro-optic active material that uh, will later be pulled. I'm now putting it into the spin coder and the spin coder will close and spin a thin polymer film onto our sample. So now that we have the electro-optic polymer filling our sol gel trenches, what we now have to do is to make sure that we remove all the residual solvent from the EO layer and we do that by placing the sample in a vacuum oven at elevated temperature overnight. I'm now opening the vacuum valve and the vacuum pump starts sucking out the air of, out of the vacuum oven and you see that by the vacuum gauge going down. So now that we almost reached our final vacuum, I'm opening a gas valve and adjusting the nitrogen flow. I do that so I drive residual uh, oxygen out of the system that is still in there from the air as well as creating a constant flow of dry nitrogen that will remove solvent from the fill much more efficiently. And this will be in here overnight at 80 degrees and tomorrow we'll be back for attaching electrodes and polling. So now it's the next morning and if you're wondering why I'm still wearing the same shirt that's because I'm a grad student. Um, I'm now closing the vacuum well to the pump and I open the vent valve and more nitrogen is sucked into the vacuum oven and as soon as standard pressure is reached I'm able to open the door. Right now the door is held shut by the vacuum inside or to be more precise by the air pressure pressing at it from the outside. So now the oven is back to around one atmosphere of pressure and I can open the door. Closing the vent valve and I can take the sample out. Um, I'm about to cleave out uh, one of the devices to go to the polling oven right next. Okay, so I'm making a small scratch on one side of the silicon wafer. This is creating a defect in the crystal structure. And if everything goes well, I should be able to apply some pressure on a soft surface and the wafer should break along the crystalline axis. And it did. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cleave out two waveguides by cleaving around here and I will have this sample that is ready to go into the oven.
Now I'm gonna take this one, look very carefully with my bare eye where the electrode, the round electrode pads were. And as soon as I see them, I'm gonna use the tweezers to very gently remove the top polymer layer right here and right there. So now I can make contact to the small electrode pads. I'm using a two component epoxy that is highly filled with silver particles to attach the wire to the sample. We use that because we can't use solder at those samples because we have organic materials in close neighborhood to the parts we want to make contact to and they would simply burn. I take up some of the epoxy, I put some on the wire I want to attach and I simply make contact like this. Bring in a second wire, again pick up a little bit of conductive epoxy and make contact to the second pad. Now, the waveguide is still in between those. During the polling process, the device is heated up to the glass transition temperature of the electro-optic polymer and a high voltage is applied between the two electrodes. This will cause the chromophore molecules to align along the electric field, creating a non-centrosymmetric material that shows Chi2 activity or is electro-optic active. So now we have placed our samples with the epoxied on wires into our polling oven. The wires now go to uh, contacts that make their way up to our high voltage power supply. The sample itself is sitting on a two stack of Peltier elements that we're going to use for heating it up during the polling process. This here is a, a thermocouple element that we use to monitor the temperature and this we use to blow nitrogen over the sample during the polling process. This program controls the temperature of the oven as well as it reads out the polling current. This first graph here is the temperature inside the chamber. This is the polling current. Um, this graph here um, gives us the control over the heating current in the oven. Here we type in to the program on what heating rate we're interested in, what how much how many degrees per minute we want to heat up. And here are just additional information about which what kind of sample it is that will be later written in a spreadsheet that is created by the LabVIEW program. So here um, we control the heating rate. We can either step immediately to a given temperature or ramp to a given temperature at a specific rate. For this sample I want to heat at 10 degrees per minute which corresponds to 0.8333 degrees per 5 seconds. Here I can enter additional sample parameters that I want the program to save in the Excel spreadsheet. So oh, my electrode separation is 10 microns, this is I'm entering here, and my polling field is 75 volts per micron, so I'm applying 750 volts. So now we are ready to start the polling process and I'm going to reset the graphs and start to heat. The polling voltage is applied during the whole polling process from the beginning to the end. And in this case we applied 750 volts. The program reads out the thermocouple and then tells this black box what is a high current power supply how much current to pump through the thermoelectric coolers and we're not using them as coolers but as heaters. Mm -hmm. um, you have chromophore molecules inside the polymer. Mm -hmm. They are randomly oriented. To have an electro-optic effect, the material needs to be non-centrosymmetric. It has to have one refractive index in one direction and another refractive index in the other direction. Um, and this is what we're doing in the polling process. We're basically creating a non-centrosymmetric material. The current, if I heat higher and higher, will just increase till the sample breaks down. 
but what we're going to do is as soon as we hit our final our goal temperature we're going to shut the heater off and it starts to cool down immediately so right now we are in our um, waveguide device testing lab and I'm now right now placing a phase modulator into our testing stage it's going to be held down by a vacuum pump I'm attaching the electrodes to our voltage supply that we're going to later use to modulate the device and on this test setup the device is sitting here in the middle stage we have two controls to adjust Y and X position on this side we have a lensed fiber where we can again Y, X and Z position as well as tip tilt on this side right now we have a microscope objective that we use for two things one is we image the back side of the sample onto a camera the other thing is so the, that we also image the light that comes out of the sample um, once we're done aligning we're gonna bring in a second fiber on this side we're gonna couple fiber to fiber set up a max sender interferometer and then characterize the electro optic properties of our device here we have our device this is the lens fiber tip that I'm gonna bring in right now to barely touching the sample and now we can switch over to the monitors so here we this, this is the top view of the devices on the cleaved edge these are the electrodes that we've seen before and now we also see the patterned waveguide trench sitting right in the middle of them what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna bring the fiber in and we're gonna see coming from the right hand side so this is now the lens fiber that we're going to use to couple light into the device. SMF28 fiber would be just cut here and you would have a mode size coming out of around 10 microns diameter. But this round shape, this uh, parabola shape, actually functions as a focusing lens and brings the mode size down to around 2x2 two two micrometers which makes it easier to couple into small waveguides the focal distance is somewhere here maybe a bit further out maybe somewhere like here but I don't really have to know the exact distance because I will optimize that from the intensity reading so now we have the lens fiber and this is our waveguide this is the image of an infrared camera that images the backside of our sample where we expect the light to come out and I'm gonna start moving the fiber towards the waveguide and we're gonna see if there is some and here it was and this is the mode as it comes out of our waveguide what we're gonna do next is that we're gonna remove the lens that images the light to the camera and replace it with a second fiber and we're gonna have the light go through the device into the fiber and then onto a detector and this is when we're gonna see modulation this is the infrared camera we use for imaging the backside of the sample and what we here have this is the whole way that is used to focus the image down here is the lens I was mentioning before and here's again our sample so we can also enter a polarizer into the beam path or a power meter to measure absolute power so now I'm going to replace the microscope objective with a SMF 28 fiber This is what is called fiber to fiber coupling. I'm now going to bring the fiber in. For this I first have to change the magnification, otherwise I don't see the fiber. 
and there it is. Again, I'm going to roughly align it at a low magnification. Then again, go to a higher magnification. This is where the waveguide comes out of the device. It ends here. This is the end phase, and this is our SMF28 fiber, where we're now coupling the light in. So I'm now going to adjust the position of the fiber while um, looking at the output power from a detector that is displayed on a multimeter. And when I find the optimal position, I'll stop. For testing the device, we will use two fibers, one with a lens tip and one regular SMF28 fiber. Between those fibers will be our device with the waveguide. We're going to couple in from this side and couple out from this side. The electrodes will be connected to a function generator that applies a certain voltage. Our laser source will be split into two. One will go through the device. The other one will go through an attenuator. This is to make sure that when we combine the two arms afterwards, they have approximately the same intensity and we will see a high quality signal. After the attenuator, the two optical arms are combined again and go to a detector. This detector changes the optical to an electrical signal and is then going to an oscope that also receives a reference signal from the original voltage source. We have a laser source. The laser source goes through a polarization control, then goes through a 50-50 split. One arm goes through our device. The other arm goes through a optical attenuator, what's basically only there to simulate the optical loss that we experience in our device. The two arms, one after passing through our device, the other one directly from here, are combined in another 50-50 split. The combination of these then go to a detector where they interfere with each other. The detector transforms the, the optical into an electrical signal and then goes to an oscilloscope. What we see on the oscilloscope are two signals. The yellow signal is the driving signal. It's the voltage that's applied to the device. The purple signal is, what is the optical signal that comes out of the device. So if we go from here to here, this is one minimum and this is the other, this is a maximum. This is how we can measure the switching voltage Vpi of the device. 